So Lord, um, do what you want to do. Have your way. Jesus, it's all about you. You're the teacher. You come in here and, and teach. Oh, the power of your presence, Lord. We desperately need you. Thank you, Lord. And we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. She prays God often. Um, and in fact, that's the NIV. I'm actually going to be in the New King James, but I, I put the title verse in the NIV. Um, when you see, uh, you know, we're coming off Thanksgiving Praise and thanksgiving go together. When you, when you go through the word, often thanksgiving and praise are together. And so, um, so she praised God. Part of that was thanksgiving. Uh, this is the lady who was bent over for 18 years who was set free by Jesus. And some of your translations will say she glorified God. Some will say she praised God. I don't know that. I don't know that any of them say she thanked God. I think it's all praise or glorified. But, um, but you know, thanksgiving was mixed into the praise and the glory. So she praised God. Luke 13, 13, again, NIV just for this, and then we'll do New King James, and then we'll switch to NIV. I don't know if I'll tell you or not. I just made just be scrolling on down. Then he put his hands on her, which is interesting to me because Jesus healed in a variety of ways. He didn't always lay hands on people, and this is one of the people he did lay hands on, and so it's, that just is interesting to me. He put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Immediately. I like that word, too. Immediately. Then he put his hands on her and immediately. It doesn't say he said anything at that point. He just put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. So let's just for a moment, just get this straight. 18 years. 18 years. 18, 2004, 2005. Is that no? 2005, 2006, 2007, all the way to 2023. Immediately, she straightened up and praised God. That's wild. That's just wild. And some people were happy, and some people were not. So this is Luke chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. Before I start, I want to just say real quick, this, um, this is something uh, Dutch Sheets just spoke at a conference with Chuck Pierce called the Josiah. It wasn't conference, was it? Josiah something was conference, which is, is it okay, Kevin? I don't see, jo is it okay? So, okay. The baby's name is Josiah. The Kevin and Jess's baby's name is Josiah. The one that's coming that we just prayed for. Okay, y'all don't say. I, but they just had this conference where Dutch and Chuck were there, a Clay Nash conference, and it was called the, it was called the Josiah Company, I think, and they were having a conference. And so we, we, uh, Hilda and all the Samaritan's Purse people were here feverishly putting boxes together, and I was watching Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce <laughs> and forgot to even text and say, do you need anything? <laughs> I was just like, but um, on Friday night, Dutch had a sermon that was awesome. It was just an awesome sermon. In it, he hit on this passage, and he talked about what I'm about to talk about but it was on the way to other things. And, and I said, I'm going to spend some time on that. I told Angie, I'm, I'm going to spend some time on that piece right there. So this piece is from a Dutch sheet sermon that I'm pulling out. And just like Rachel's joke, I'm making it Danny's. But hopefully it'll, 
it'll be good. So, so with that little introduction, here we go. Uh, and this is now the New King James. Luke 13, 10 through 11. And remember, Luke's, Luke's a physician, so he's very observant when Jesus interacts and heals. He's very, you know, uh, well, you get that. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Um, now, how's a good way to say this? Jesus had to be invited to be teaching in the synagogue, right? Right? He doesn't just walk in and take over. So he's been invited to teach on the Sabbath in that synagogue. So everything, everything has been very nice and cordial, evidently, you know, before he makes everybody go sideways. Everything is going well. He's teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, right? And, and it's, all, it's all copacetic. And... Um, and in this congregation, there's a woman. And now, now it's really important because, and we have a medical doctor here, and I'm aware of that, and I, I give great, wondrous praise to Cindy, the medical doctor. And, and, and you know, I got a lot of education, and I, I respect that. But the wisdom of the Babylonians and the wisdom of the Egyptians is not enough. I don't know if you get that. The wisdom of the Babylonians and the wisdom of the Egyptians is not enough. Science without God is going to lead you somewhere that is not truth. Um. I know people, I have known people who, who, are, who are so into, and this may not mean anything to you, but, but rationality and the scientific method, and they, they have a problem believing the Lord, but the scientific method was founded on the presupposition, because everything has presuppositions. The scientific method was founded on the presupposition that there was a God who had created everything. Right, right. There was a designer, and if there was a designer, there was an order which meant that we could actually investigate and find how things were put together right, right, right. to benefit us, and the Lord would actually help us, and there would be revelation in the midst of the empiricism. I just used a fancy word. Yeah, it, some of you go, I didn't know he knew that word. I, I will pull one out every once in a while, brush it off, and say, here, check this out. I have a degree or two. <laughs> but mostly I'm, I'm Mayberry, so, you know, so we're good. So, so here's Luke, who has all the wisdom of the Babylonians and the Egyptians. He's, he's a physician. He's in here, and, um, well, I don't know if he's, in here at this moment, or if he's getting this later from someone else, because I didn't really check it. I, I guess he got it from someone else. I witnessed later, but whatever. He's interested in what's going on here in the details. Jesus is teaching, and behold, like, wow, how can you miss it? There's a woman bent over. So even while she's sitting, she's bent over. She's looking, she's looking at the ground. Animals look at the ground. They've been placed on legs to look at the ground. Man has been made to be erect and look to the stars. Animals are earth-bound. Their, their existence. But man is supposed to be heavenward. Right? Is that good? Is that too far? Okay. 
So this woman, for 18 years, 18 years, has been looking at the ground, at the floor, at the road, at whatever. And in order to look up, she has to do something to try to look up or people have to get down in front of her to talk to her. She's somebody's mom, possibly. She's somebody's sister. She's definitely somebody's daughter. People care about her. This, I feel like I got hair, get out of the way. Um, this woman, I don't know if this is her regular synagogue or if she's come because there's a special speaker. There's an evangelist in town, you know. I don't know if she's there because Jesus is speaking or if this is her regular synagogue that she's been in all of her life. But I assume, just without any other details, that this is, this is a place she's familiar with and there are people here who love her. I assume there are people here who've prayed for her. It's just my assumption. It's, there's nothing here to say that, but there's nothing here not to say that. So, so I try to put myself, and I know that if there was a woman in here, in that situation, we would have prayed for her many times. Right? Right. Okay. So, and also, sometimes... Sometimes it, something is coming from an accident. She was in a camel crash. <laughs> Head on camel crash. Um, it, it could be something that had gone wrong internally with, with body chemistry, hormones, or all kinds. There's biological things that can happen. That all can happen, but there are also devils. There's also darkness. And even the stuff that happens naturally, because it's a part of the curse, you could still say it's part of the darkness, even though it doesn't have to be a spirit causing it. But, but Luke is very clear here. What is causing her to be this way is a spirit of infirmity. Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke. Everybody okay with that? Is that too much? I mean, it's the word. The word's saying it. Pick a fight with Luke. And um, so a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. It doesn't say where she was. It doesn't say, doesn't say that she made an agreement with the devil. It doesn't say that she, you know, her dad was in the Masonic Lodge. It doesn't say, you know, that there was ritual satanic abuse. It doesn't say any of that. It just says... She had a spirit of infirmity that caused her to be bent over for 18 years. That's all it says. We don't know how it happened. We don't know, right? So she couldn't raise herself up. That word infirmity there is basically weakness. Weakness. We are built to have bodies that are strong and healthy. And infirmity is any time our body begins to break down and we have a place, you can say the devil can exploit if it's spiritual or you can say that germs have access because immunities are low, however you want to say it. But we go through a weakness, how does it say, a want of strength, um, frailty, feebleness, um, and it can, be, it can be of mind or body. Um, I just like to say this word, so I'm going to say it. Malady. It's like my lady. <laughs> Malady. <laughs> I just wanted to say it. That's all. It's up there, so I can say it. Malady. Um, The enemy wants to find a weakness to exploit. And sometimes a weakness in the body that we don't handle well leads to a weakness in the soul. 
And sometimes a weakness in the soul leads to a weakness in the body. Today, Roger said, how you doing? I said, well, I could tell you I'm fine. But tell you the truth, I just soon be in the recliner wrapped up in front of the logs. <laughs> he said, well, the weather will do that to everybody. I said, well, thank you. I thought I just had a bad attitude. <laughs> I appreciate that. So now I know it's the weather and not my bad attitude. Yeah. So I've been fighting my bad attitude, but now I'm going to put it off on the weather. Which is what they did in the garden. That serpent, <laughs> that woman, <laughs> okay, you just shovel it off onto something else and avoid responsibility. Avoid my bad attitude. It's the weather. So um, so that's, a spirit has come and created a weakness in this woman that for 18 years, her body's been crooked. Imagine the toll that has had on her soul and spirit. Imagine the weight of that, carrying that for 18 years. So 12 and 13, but when Jesus saw her, now he's teaching in there. I don't know when he first saw her, but there comes a time when he sees her and he has an intention to do something about it. And maybe it had been building in him. I, I can tell you that, that there, are, there are times that I'm speaking and the Lord will focus me on somebody. <laughs> Just like, it's, it's like... Uh, it's like uh, Peter and John going through the gate beautiful and it, and it says like how Peter just like looked at him, you know, kind of thing. And uh, Paul looked at that little fortune teller girl, you know, it, it, something seizes your attention and, and you feel like there's something the Lord wants to do, you know. And so you begin listening and watching while you're continuing like I... I I've had that experience of like Jesus teaching, but he begins to focus on her and begins formulating what it is the Lord wants to do. He may have known when he walked in there. I don't know, because he's Jesus. I'm just telling you that that's, that's a familiar sounding experience to me. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Check this out. First of all, loosed, you're set free. Which implies she was in bondage. When he said, woman, T.D. Jakes went crazy with this. Woman, thou art loosed. You know, <laughs> right? right? Wasn't there a whole thing that came out of that? And that lady that had that sermon, you know, and the whole thing, woman, thou art loved. You are set free. Jesus is all about freedom. He is not about bondage. Not about bondage. He wants to set us free and set us in a beautiful place. No fences, no walls, an expanse of beautiful terrain that we love. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He said, woman, you're free. She had been in bondage for 18 years. Woman, you are free. But the ruler of the synagogue, who evidently had been okay with Jesus' teaching, but Jesus has just crossed a line. There is a no-no. We did not ask you here to minister. We asked you here to teach. We just want your teaching. Just focus on the word and step down and let me close the service. Don't go outside the lines. Use your crayons properly. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Now, indignation is a strong word, and it's a negative word. But, but here, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just trying to, 
we automatically go to he was jealous, he was envious. I don't know, he may have genuinely felt like that was inappropriate. Paul did atrocious things sincerely believing it was against God. I mean, the things that he was dealing with. He was hauling people off to prison. He was doing all kinds of stuff to them, thinking he was serving God. So, so this, this synagogue ruler may have genuinely thought this, but he also could have just been jealous. It could have been he's been praying for that woman for 18 years, and now the big evangelist blows through town. And she's set free. You know what I mean? That's hard. That's hard to handle. It's hard to switch gears and go, yay, the one I've been praying for for 18 years, my prayers are answered. Because you have a tendency to go, well, what were my prayers for 18 years? Jesus comes in and everybody goes, Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know why he's indignant. There can be a, let me put multiplicity of causes. <laughs> so, here's another one. A plethora of reasons. I'm going to stop. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. I just realized I'm reading back there instead of here, but y'all know it's back there too, so I'm going to keep on reading. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He's indignant he was not indignant with what Jesus was saying when he was teaching the word. Nothing there. But because he went outside the teaching and healed, he's indignant. Now again, probably he loves this woman. Probably he's prayed for this woman. Probably he wants to see her healed. But there's something here that is more raw emotionally for him than seeing her healed. So he's indignant because Jesus heals on the Sabbath. It doesn't say he's indignant because Jesus heals. It says he's indignant because Jesus heals on the Sabbath. The, the rub seems to be it's on the Sabbath. Because there's things you do on the Sabbath and there are things you don't do on the Sabbath. Right? That seems to be the rub. And he said to the crowd, so obviously there's a congregation, and he says to them, he doesn't, he doesn't speak to Jesus. Angie said that this morning when I was, I was telling her what I was doing and she was like, yeah, he doesn't address Jesus. He bypasses, he ignores Jesus and talks to his people, his congregation. He talks to the crowd and he says, there are six days on which man ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Now, now the synagogue was like a community center. It was open every day and they had synagogue school. There were activities going on at the synagogue every day. So he's saying, if you want to be healed, which only God can heal you, don't come on God's day, come on these six man days. <laughs> right? Right, right? I mean, he doesn't see it that way because he's grown up in a certain system with a certain set of traditions that go, he's got the law of Moses which is God's law, but they've added traditions and interpretations. And those things have become as big as the word of God. And he doesn't even know it's the word of God who's standing in his midst. But because before he was Yahashua, before he was Yeshua, before, before he was Jesus, his name was the word, John says. In the beginning was the word. Who knows the word like Jesus? Nobody. He is the embodiment of the word. He knows whether it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. 
He's the word. It's his word that rules on that. And so this man is indignant because he thinks the word of God says no when the word of God says yes. 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 Amen. Any day's a good day to heal. Yes. But especially my day. Yes. Because he's also the Sabbath. Six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. And to show you that this is a law issue, that this is about the interpretation of the law, just take a second. We say ought all the time, and it means should. I ought to do so and so. I should do so and so. That's right. But in the Greek, ought. It is necessary. There's a need of it. It behooves, it's right and proper. This man's saying, it's necessary for you to come these other six. It's right and proper to come these other six. Necessity lying in the nature of a case, that's legal. A necessity lying in the nature of a case, that's law. That's covenant. He's citing, he's saying it's illegal in the Mosaic Covenant for you to be healed on the Sabbath. Do you see that? A necessity of law and command, of duty, of equity. That's what a judge does. He decides what's equitable. He decides the interpretation of law. He's talking to the judge of all the living and telling him it's illegal what he just did. There's a word that we say in Mayberry called comeuppance. He's about to get his comeuppance because he don't know who he's talking to. And look, just we do this all the time. We say things like this all the time and don't even realize how stupid it is. Because we lack the revelation. We lack the proper teaching. And unless, unless we walk in a place with the Lord that the Holy Spirit can teach us, we'll never see it. We'll, walk, we'll, we'll go to heaven deceived. But if we want to be free, If we want to be loosed, we've got to walk in step with the Spirit so he can tell us what the words of life are. (laughs) I just love this. Suddenly, I don't care about being in a recliner anymore. My attitude's different. I'm like all over this. Well, I'm all about this thing, that's for sure. Concerning what Christ was destined to finally undergo. Because the ultimate legal case, here's the ultimate legal case. It's not happened yet. So far, there's been the Abrahamic covenant. There was actually a Noah covenant, but an Abrahamic covenant and a Mosaic covenant. But Jesus is here with those But looking toward this, he's about to render a verdict forever because the anointed one is here destined to undergo sufferings, death, resurrection, ascension that will change everything. And what has been binding will no longer be binding because he will set everyone free by the blood of the Lamb. The root of this word, this this word ought here, the root of it is to bind together, to tie together, to knit together, to be in bonds. That's why when he said, be loosed, because she was bound. She wasn't just bound by physical infirmity. She was bound by a doctrine. Yes, that ought. She was bound by bad teaching as much as she was bound by a spirit of infirmity. For 18 years with people who loved her, people who loved God. 
And Jesus steps in. And when, when Jesus steps in and says something that messes us up, we make a decision on whether we're glad or sad or mad. Because it's a lot to handle. Most of the people there went straight to glad, but not everybody. Verse 15, the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite. This is the comeuppance. That means two-faced one, man with a mask. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose, untie, unbind? Right, you see that? He's staying. He's staying with the wording the man used about the alt. His ox or donkey from the stall and lead it a way to water it. Jesus, standing in his midst, being confronted with the Mosaic law, which is what the guy was doing, returned with the Mosaic law and said, hypocrite, you loose your own animal to feed him or to water him on the Sabbath. That's the Mosaic covenant that you're saying she should stay bound because it's the Sabbath. Hypocrite. Now, because Jesus said hypocrite, <laughs> I'm going to assume that his indignance maybe had a little at least to do with jealousy and envy <laughs> and stuff like that. But it could still be hypocrite if he had a genuine belief in the, in the meaning of the Sabbath. Right? Hypocrite. And, and notice, Jesus didn't talk to the crowd. He talked right. to the man. <laughs> the man's talking to the crowd, ignoring Jesus. Jesus is talking to the man. He's not really thinking about the crowd. He's talking to the man. But look at this. Jesus uses that same word, alt. Same word. Now, some of you don't have a translation that has alt in it. This is why I switched to the New King James so I could show you the word in the mixed up, midst of it. So ought not this woman. Now he's already responded with the Mosaic covenant. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. Jesus just switches to what preceded Moses. To the covenant they started out with. They were not necessarily supposed to have the Mosaic covenant. They told Moses, you go meet with the Lord and come back and tell us and we'll do everything he says. They were in a, in a covenant that Abraham had that was full of grace based on relationship. And they said, you go meet for us. They chose not to meet with God to let him, Moses, represent them and to come back and tell them what to do and they would do it fully. They had broken it before Moses got back off the mountain. They had a golden calf before he even got off the mountain. Jesus switches gears and says, hypocrite. You're wrong in the Mosaic Covenant, and let me show you, this is a daughter of Abraham. I've got a relation. I know Abraham. I've got a relationship with him. I've made promises to Abraham, my friend, and I've made promises to my friend Abraham about his descendants. That sounds like fun up there. I don't know what's going on, but that sounds like more fun than I'm having. And I'm, I'm enjoying myself right now. This daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, we're going back to the tying the bound thing again. Think of it, for 18 years, six, six, six. 18, six, 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 18. Don't come on the Lord's day, the seventh. Come on the other six. 
So the wisdom of the Babylonians and the wisdom of the Egyptians can address this when you need an act of God. Be loosed. There he goes again. Be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath, on God's day of rest that God didn't make for him. He made for us. The Sabbath was made for us. It was a day of relationship where we wouldn't think about other things but just be in relationship with God and experience his blessings. And they had tied that thing up with all kinds of laws. Let me just give you an illustration. Look, this is, this is today an Orthodox Jew. This man, and he told, he told people, some of you may have been there, Grace. I know you know this story. I don't, I don't know if there are others. That on Friday night before the Sabbath came in, he would unscrew the light bulb in his refrigerator. Because if he needed food, he could go to the refrigerator to get the food. But if the light came on, he had made work. Do you see the crazy things we do to define everything? And that's what they had done. And they saw Jesus healing as a work. While they were missing the point that it was a day of rest for relationship with God. So he says, shouldn't she be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? So he's, he's using that same word alt, a legal thing, but now he's not talking about Moses. He's talking about the covenant with Abraham. Right? Should not this woman, this child of Abraham, ought not, he's referring to something before Moses. A covenant before Moses. And again, root word, bind, tie, knit, be in bonds, wind. Bound, this is the root word. Who's bound, she, he's, She's, well, you see it all. I'm not going, <laughs> I'm getting tongue twisted. And a bond is a band or a bond, a ligament in the body because of the way it works, a shackle, an impediment or disability, a chain, a string, same root word. So there, there's two different words that have the same root word and the root word is in that sentence too. Right? Luke 13, 17, and when he said these things, all his adversaries, opponents, were put to shame. Synagogue ruler. Put to shame, dishonor. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. End of Luke 13, New King James, but let me show you. Genesis 15, one. The reason it's so real to Jesus is because Jesus was in Genesis 15, one. And Jesus was there. Abram, he's not Abraham yet. Abram was there. It says after this, after what? After Abraham or Abram had gone and rescued Lot and all those kings and hadn't taken anything for it, had had communion with Melchizedek. After this, the word of the Lord, who is that? Jesus. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. How does the word of the Lord come to you in a vision? Well, we would guess he hears the word of the Lord, but it's a vision. It's because the word of the Lord is a person. The word of the Lord. Jesus came to Abram in a vision. You good? Is that okay? John 1, in the beginning was the word. You good? Okay. Do not be afraid, Abram. How does just the words, I am your shield. 
I am your very great reward. I'm the earnings and the wages you haven't even earned. I'm your very great reward. I'm the shield about you. Nothing can penetrate to touch you because I'm the shield about you. I'm your protection. You just went and beat kings because I'm the shield about you, right? There's no need for you to be afraid. No, no reason for you to worry about somebody coming after you now. You haven't got to go hide somewhere because you're hidden. We could say Psalm 91 under the shelter of the wing, but in my shield because I'm the shield about you. I encompass you. And then skipping down a little. Verse four. Then the word of the Lord Jesus came to him. How does the word come to somebody? Jesus came to him. This man will not be your heir. As soon as Jesus started talking to him, he started saying, but, but I ain't got, you promised, you promised me that I would have these children and I ain't got no children. I'm gonna have to leave it to my, to my servant. Jesus responds, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He's called the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus. And the seed of Abraham comes through Isaac. And you can just go down. The seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham accomplishes all the covenant because the covenant is a promise and he's the promise keeper. He will keep the covenant. Right? A son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. His name will be laughter, joy. Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Martin Luther built a whole movement on this. It's quoted in the New Testament. Pivotal. Abram was the friend of God because he believed God. When the sun had set, 1517, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. The Lord basically said to him in chapter 15, a son, your own flesh and blood will be your heir and see all this land here, it's all yours. The messianic line is yours. The royal line of the earth is yours, Abraham. David's going to come through it. And all this is yours. The earth is yours. In all the promises to Abraham, he mentions the sand of the seashore and the stars of Jesus came as the son of man, the dirt, and the son of God, the heavens. And God will take all the descendants of Abraham and carry them home one day, right? And we today are descendants of Abraham because he's grafted us in. We are known as children of Abraham. So what he told him to do was get these animals. I won't go through it. I love to preach this chapter. Cut them in half, nose to tail, put them on an incline, so the blood drains into a ditch. Abraham knows what it is. Terror fills Abraham. He's fighting vultures all day, which is a good symbol of the demonic trying to interrupt what God wants to do. Still kill and destroy. And finally, God puts him to sleep, puts him to rest. What is Sabbath? Rest. He put Adam to rest, brought forth Eve. He put Abraham to rest, brought forth a covenant and a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, two symbols of the presence of God. In fact, presence of the Father and the Son go between the pieces and what they say, because what you're saying in a covenant like that, when you make a covenant with someone, uh, like you're making Abraham making a covenant with another king, you're saying, if I ever 
fail in this covenant we're making today, you can cut me to pieces like these animals. And so imagine the terror that Abraham must have had to think of cutting covenant with God because God's never going to fail. But Abraham knows he's going to fail and fail often. And God puts him to sleep and does it himself so that he says, Abraham, I'm in covenant with you. And if I ever fail in my promise to you, you can cut me asunder like these animals. And Abraham, if you ever fail in your covenant to me, you can cut me asunder like these animals. That's the cross. That's him taking our place. And the one who stood there and gave Abraham that promise stands before a descendant of Abraham. A daughter of Abraham. And he was there just day before yesterday. It's nothing to him. He was just there. He just made that promise. And he said, you hypocrite. You don't even know what you're talking about. The Mosaic Covenant teaches in a way that you can heal on the Sabbath. But just so you know, this woman is a descendant of Abraham and she ought legally to be free to be loosed. And I'm the seed of Abraham and I loose her. She's free. And people rejoiced. When, when, when Dutch did this part, Dutch got to a great pivotal point. He said, there was nothing in Jesus that could keep him from healing her. It was so powerful in him, nothing could prevent him from healing her. But he went to a greater covenant and he's on the way to bring us a covenant that's greater than those covenants. We stand in a covenant in the blood of Jesus where he's already walked the pieces and we've already been given the victory. We're already loosed. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. It's 12.09. Panthers have won one game this year. But they might win another one, and I do want to see it. Kevin, was there another slide? Yes? Is it still on here? Is it gone? There should be one more after this? Okay. Well, I know that there was an, another slide like that. Like, after Genesis, there's Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, but I, was there another slide? Oh, there's not another slide. Okay. Oh, yeah, there is. There is another slide. <laughs> yeah, okay. Have you got time to prepare it while I talk about this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Angie says she's leaving. <laughs> and just was laughing. So Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, he's the seed. It says it right there. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the New Testament starts. He's the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of David. He is the king. And every promise made to Abraham, every promise made to David, he fulfills so that every promise in Christ is yes, yes. Amen. amen. And that's our part, to say the yes, amen. Yes, yes amen. So today, you're free. Just close your eyes for a second. Thank you, Lord, for making us free. Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. Thank you, Lord, for loosing us. Thank you, Lord, for breaking every bond. Thank you, Lord, for breaking everything physically and soul-wise that keeps us back. Thank you for breaking every deception. Thank you, Lord, for breaking every bad teaching, every bad attitude. Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. Amen? Amen. Amen. The praise team can come up. We're good, Kevin? Ho! This is a very young picture of Diana. Diana. The reason I wanted to put this picture up of Diana 
is to honor Diana for having Angie <laughs> a few years ago, just a few years ago. And we celebrated that yesterday. So Diana, thank you. You're a good mother-in-law. And in that way, Angie cannot fuss with me at all because I just honored her mother. <laughs> but I will say, she still looks like that to me. I don't know about to y'all, but that's how she looks to me. And you too, Diana. So we're going to transition now. Is everybody saved? Is everybody saved? Everybody's saved? Yes? Okay. All right. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you that you wouldn't lie to me at this moment in the service. Well, we're going to uh, partake of the, uh, the Lord's table. And the bread is here for us to remember what he did for us. He was torn asunder for us. He fulfilled that covenant. And his blood was shed for us. It says, uh, it says to be mindful of his body and that by his stripes we were healed. And by his blood he gave us life, life, eternal life, overwhelming, abundant life, life that overcomes death. So let's pray. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the the bread, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for being here with us as we, as we uh, participate with you in what some call a memorial feast. There's no greater meal So we thank you for this time of remembrance. Come and meet with us, Lord. Come and change us. Come and speak to us and show us things. And we just praise you and thank you. Glorify your name. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.